Hello everyone and welcome back to Shonen Archive, the series in which me and Zenrado go through all of Shonen Jump anime through the history of Shonen Jump and future, now, present, alternate universe. I'm Wookie and I'm here with Zenro. Hello. Hello, and now that's our intro. Boom, perfect. Did it. Absolutely. I'm totally going to remember that next week. <laughs> I'm totally not going to forget <laughs> this. <laughs> totally not going to forget the second we start, but hey, close enough. So what are we doing today? Let's see. Well, last episode, we were originally going to do five episodes. We were too busy, so we did two, which was episodes uh, 36 and 37. And so today, we're going to be talking about for Gintama, episodes 38, 39, and 40. So, ready? Are you ready, Zen? Ready to get into this? I am ready. Perfect. Let's go. So let's start with... Episode 38, which is called, uh, oh shit, I clicked the wrong thing on the fandom, oh my god, I don't wanna, I, I don't know if you know this, I don't know if you're someone who goes onto a lot of the wiki fandom stuff for Zen, for stuff Zen, but this site has gotten progressively worse over the years, and it's making me actively sad. I literally never go on it for anything other than refreshers on Gintama. I have to constantly go on here over the years because the Fago stuff lives here. And I really wish that there was a better site because the last one that was being kept, the guy just gave up and ghosted us. <laughs> and he's gone. <laughs> never came back. Just one day left and never returned. So the only <laughs> thing to keeping it going is the wiki. And to, for, to find it in an easy place in English and stuff like that. And the site that they use is this fandom site. And this fandom site is actively terrible. They constantly introduce new things that make the site worse. They never make it better. And I don't know why. That's my rant on that. If, leave a comment down below. Tell us how your feelings on the <laughs> fandom wikis in general. Glad to hear if there's other people who deal with this. Because this really is the only way for certain series for you to catch up on things. And I don't know. All right, enough about that. The name of this episode is called Only Children Play in the Snow. Uh, it's actually a two-parter. And the uh, the uh, the super translation is called Only Only Children No, it's the it's uh, only, only children ki- play in the snow. Yes, but only kids will rollick around in the snow is the super specific translation of it. And then part 2, which is eating ice cream in winter is a rather strange experience or as it's called here, I think it is uh eating eating ice, ice cream, cream in winter is awesome. Yes, which I agree with actually. But we'll get into that when we actually get into that episode that's fully talking about <laughs> eating ice cream in winter. Why don't you start us off, Zen? So the first one, uh, the kids don't play in the snow, or only kids play in the snow, is uh, it just starts snowing, and they're like, that's weird. Anyway, we're doing it. And uh, Shinpachi is, like, in the snow, almost looking like he's dying. <laughs> he's having, like, an internal monologue as he's laying in the snow. And then we roll back, and we see Atose announcing the very first snow festival for the Kabukicho block, like the, whatever the little area part of town they're in. Yeah, yeah. And they're gonna make snow sculptures, and the best one wins a prize. And Kentoki and Kagura are building one that Shinpachi assumes is a penis, but it's actually the Neo, Neo Armstrong, Armstrong Cyclone, Cyclone Jet, Jet Armstrong, Armstrong Cannon. Cannon. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm glad we could come together on that. Set. And every time someone comes up to see it, they go, oh my god, it's the Neo Armstrong Cyclone <laughs> Jet Armstrong Cannon. What wonderful form, or something like that. Yeah, it's like, what do they say? Oh, it's you... got like great refinement or something yeah, like that. Yeah, it's you really refined the point of it. Like, th- th- there's a specific <laughs> thing about it that is extremely refined, <laughs> and then they come up with like a, a completely different backstory for it every single time someone comes up to talk about it. And uh, so Hasegawa comes up first, and he's like, "Oh, I'm also making one." And his statue is like a Greek sculpture of himself with angel wings. <laughs> um. And so Kentoki starts destroying it because he wants to win the contest. And it turns out that the statue has like a penis. Some, I, I'm assuming it's like a dildo or something. I don't know. I, I assumed it was they, one made out of ice. But he has a whole wheelbarrow of them later. Yeah, he kept. that means he made those. <laughs> it means, that's, what, that's what makes it way funnier is that he loses his mind and he makes a bunch of them. The reason I said that is because when he's throwing it, he says they're all going to melt anyway. So who cares? Well, I assume that he meant the statues. Oh, that's uh, true. But too. maybe. 
And so they, they throw a bunch of snowballs it. at it to knock it off. And then it flies into like a local gang statue that comes to attack them. And uh, Gintoki destroys the statue in order to stop the gang. And then uh, with this, the, they destroyed the statue, so they went back to their own. And Gintoki's like, I want wings on the cannon. Because <laughs> he stole the idea. <laughs> and then the next person shows up, and it's Katsura. And he's like, look, I made a playground for all of the children to play. And it's like, I hope everyone enjoys this for a long time. And then Kentucky and Kakura start destroying it also. <laughs> Immediately. <laughs> While little kids are playing on it. Um, so they destroy it, and then they put a, a slide from it on their statue. And then Sachan just makes a Gintoki statue, and Gintoki actually likes it because it's just like a better looking version of him. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, Yeah, no, this one's going to win. Uh, and then Sachan climbs into the statue's arms and breaks them off, and they like have a panic attack. Um, and she grabs the arms and turns around and grabs Ote's chest with them, mm. and she punches Gintoki. <laughs> <laughs> and then she's like, oh my god, those arms were so realistic. I really thought it was you <laughs> grabbing me. Um, and then they find out that Ote made like a giant mansion of snow. And, and uh, they don't even know how to destroy that. So they're embarrassed and like they, they're going to leave. But then Hasegawa and Katsura both run out throwing the, the penises all over all the statues. How's it going? Still- because they've gone insane from having theirs destroyed. It's great because also guy was throwing like <laughs> rocking back penises left and right, and Katsura is just like, I he he takes a stance against uh, slides in general. He says like if if one slide goes down, it, it will just get destroyed. Therefore, I'm damning all the slides in the world, and he just starts hammering everything. Yeah, on the he's, I want there to be all slides destroyed. <laughs> Pretty good. Uh, and, and, then, and after... then they're like, sorry. They, it turns out that it's not a cash prize, but it's 100 cups of Bagandas. Yeah, 100 <laughs> cups. And so they're like, seriously, that's all it was for? And so they all just like riot and start attacking each other. Or Bagandash, that's what it is. Um, and so they all go insane and they all start attacking each other in like a giant snowball riot. And then uh, we come back to the present day where Shinpachi's laying, dying in the snow. And he asks Otose if this is what it's supposed to be like, or if it's like a, a snowball fight. And she says, no, it's a festival. And then it ends. Yeah. Uh, so we'll start with, we'll talk about part one before we go into part two, as we usually do for these ones. Um, this, this episode, I really liked this. I thought it was really funny. <laughs> Maybe it's because it goes, it, go, it combines a lot of the things I like in general, which is uh, people screwing around, and there's a lot of screwing around on this. I really like them constantly bringing up the Neo Armstrong Cyclone Jet Armstrong Cannon because in the beginning, Shibachi's like, oh, you're obviously lying. It's supposed to be it. You've made a dick statue. How dare you? You've, you're going to offend everyone, and everyone else is like, he's like, you're dirty minded. Get away from us. We don't want to talk to you. I don't know why you think it's that. Yeah, Kagura's like, don't talk to me for a while. You're gross. Yeah. And every single person that comes And then up, later on, they admit that it actually was just a dick. Yeah, he goes, ah, oh, finally, the truth revealed. And the, the <laughs> best payoff of that joke is that um, when uh, Tay goes up after the statue of uh, Gintoki's been destroyed, she goes, oh, look, it's the Neo Armstrong Cyclone Jet Armstrong Cannon. <laughs> yeah, literally just, everyone calls it that. It's like um, Katsura... Otai Han Hasegawa all call it that, I think. Yeah, but then w- the fact that she starts calling it to the Gintoki st- uh, statue after it loses its arms. And then oh, yeah, her- and then doesn't she also, the, everyone also says it to the regular statue after they add all the stuff to it so it no longer looks like that anymore. Yes. It's like covered in other shit and they're all still like, it's the Neo Strong yeah. Cannon. They, yeah, they keep thinking it. They it's automatically distinguishable what it is. I really like how they keep destroying other people's stuff <laughs> to just slowly build on theirs, and it's not like a giant grand thing. They're just like, oh yeah, just like tiny improvements. And everyone else had so much better things, like uh, Hasegawa's giant uh, depiction of himself and the fact that he made it realistic. And he's like, no, no, it's okay, it's art. You know, when you see those Greek dudes, they got their dongs hanging out. It's art. It's okay. And even then, they're like, no, no, absolute pervert, and they destroy it, and then it keeps landing on everything. 
And then also continuing uh, Katsura's continuous love for Elizabeth, the giant Elizabeth slide that also looks kind of like an extremely terrifying thing to give the children to play on. Uh, But when they're playing on it, they're like immediately like uh, uh, Kagura goes up the slide by like saying like, oh, this is how you play with it. He's like, no. And then Gintoki's like, where's the stat? uh, Where's the steps? And he's like completely the steps are like right below him on the steps. And he, and he says, like, what like are you? He literally mountain? just got up the steps. He's like, what are you, mountain goats? Uh, yeah, and then... Oh, yeah, uh, and they also go down the slide uh, in, like, mountain climbing shoes to ruin it. Yeah, they just completely destroy it. Um, I also like the changing of the backstory every single time. <laughs> just because no one can actually get a straight answer as to what yeah, it is. Yeah, of the canon. Yeah, of all yeah. the different wars that the canon supposedly won. Yeah. He's like, and the the first one, was, which is, uh, I think, the funniest is like, oh, yeah, that's what uh, ended the war here. He's like, that's what we lost to? <laughs> yeah, this is the canon that forced Tokyo to surrender. <laughs> it's like, I can't believe we lost to this. Uh, I also liked it when uh, Kentucky caught strays from uh, Tay, even though it was obviously not him <laughs> who did it, which is continuing her... What she did to uh, Kondo, which is whatever reality best fits her narrative, she will gladly do. <laughs> or it's like, oh, mm-hmm. yeah, this is this is obviously not Kondo. It's some kind of gorilla. I'm going to beat up on it. It's like, no, it's Kondo. And then she just plays, like, oh, 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 my God, you're right. <laughs> Except for in this case, she doesn't. She just 100% goes like, obviously, it was you. Disgusting pervert. I hate you. <laughs> He's like, why? I didn't do anything. <laughs> Uh, I love it when uh, Hasegawa and Katsuro start freaking out because Asuka was just chucking these things left and right. Yeah, he's just hurling them all over the place. <laughs> just all over it, and he keeps landing on the lady's head, which is the funniest part. Um, when it's revealed that uh, when Tay starts freaking out, because everyone basically starts freaking out, it starts like a chain reaction. Hasegawa is shown first. Katsuro starts freaking out. Then Tay freaks out. She picks up this giant turtle. And after learning, like, no, I was promised 100, cu- like, uh, she was going to share the 100 cups, but she, regardless, she wanted the cups. And then that causes Gintoki and Kagura to freak out. And everyone's just like 100% screwing out. So, real. Real fun way to start off of it. It's, it was a good way to kind of get back into the group of things, and it's also a good part one to the more serious part of part two. So it was a good uh, distinction, I think, in that case. So, yeah, I really like. it. Yeah, this. this is one of those ones that was, like, completely pointless. It did nothing, but at the same yes. time, it's like, it's not so bad. <laughs> yeah, I'm just kind of enjoying it. You just got to take yourself on the ride a little bit. <laughs> just enjoy it. Be like, yeah, what do you think about it? You've already given started your stuff. Why don't you tell us more? Yeah, I just I liked it. Uh, the funniest part was easily when um, Ote punches the shit out of Kentucky, and he's just like, "Why me? <laughs> I didn't do anything." <laughs> uh, that was definitely the best joke of this part. Um, but the whole thing was just like silly fun. I kind of like this. Like, this is some slice of life stuff that I wished other series would have, where it's just the cast yeah. like doing something irrelevant and just like fucking around and having fun. Yeah, which is funny enough, this is this is a thing that I had a conversation with a friend of mine when Dragon Ball Super was originally coming out, when I told him, like, oh yeah, it's just Goku, and he's just, like, being a farmer, and he's like, what? Sign me the hell up, that's actually all I would ever want, <laughs> is just these characters kind of hanging out for a bit, and let me see what Goku's doing, trying to live a life of trying to be a farmer and those were his favorite parts actually where it's like oh yeah let me just see these characters in this kind of element and then i'm i'm kind of good i don't always need the the crazy story beats of it and then obviously dragon ball super (laughs) continued being whatever it is but i really like slice of wood stuff is basically the end of it and i like it when um usually typical shonen's actually kind of just let you let the let you just enjoy the characters for a bit hang out with them for like 12 minutes perfectly fine time Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was definitely not enough for a full episode, but that's why it wasn't one. It was just a little half. Though, imagine how crazy this episode. I actually don't think the premise would have worked with more characters. Funny though, because at that point it would have been like you just show every other character and they have like just different statue. They picked the right dudes. It's like okay, these four, we're good. We don't need any more. <laughs> we're good. Twelve minutes. We're out. Bing bang. Done. Mm-hmm. In out done. Perfect. Uh, now let's go on to part B, which is eating ice cream in winter is awesome. 
So part B is odd jobs get hired to look after an old man who has gone senile because he has not done firework stuff for a long time. Uh, his wife is very sick, and they expect her to die sometime soon. And then the old man can't remember it, um, can't remember her. And he ends up leaving the house, and while everyone else stays to listen to the wife's story, Kintoki follows him and finds him in a little hut where he's actually working on fireworks. Um, and he ends up shooting off a firework that on, on like the 58th anniversary of when he originally asked his wife to marry him. Uh, and then they're all kind of, all the characters kind of all sit on their own wherever they are. Like Kentoki, Kagura, and Shimpachi are like at a noodle stand. And the wife is driving in a car with her son when she sees the firework. And they have like a very heartwarming little moment at the end there where he asks if she saw it. Yeah. Yeah, that's basically the entire episode for this one. Uh, I really liked this one too. I thought it was a very sweet story because it was the telling its tale. It was just funny because it's sweet, but there's also like some tinges of <laughs> the humor of there in there. Like, I think there's a joke about how, um, in this kind of situation, the, I think they say a, a woman can survive without the husband, but the husband <laughs> breaks down the second the wife leaves. Which I think some yeah, people... where he's like, it's a shame uh, that, you know, women do fine after their husbands die, but once the wife dies, husbands just fall <laughs> apart immediately. <laughs> they, just, they just fall apart immediately, which I thought was very dark, was very funny. I like it when they're kind of like looking after the old man. There's some silly bits there, like when he has a he has a dog who I think he names uh, I think Michael J. Dogs, which is, I think, a uh, pun. Well, they, he gives Michael it a J. different name like every single time he says the dog's name. Oh, does he? okay. So the last one, yeah. I like at was... first he calls it like something Gundam related, and Kagura's like, "That's a great name." And then uh, he's like, "No, that's not its name. It's this." And then eventually, it's Michael J. Dox. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is a nice reference to Michael J. Fox. Um, but I kind of liked it where Kentucky talks about specifically what he views in humanity, and I think this is the episode right where he talks about that deep down even if he doesn't remember something inside himself will still kind of remember like he's the, the feelings will still be there even if the mind is gone is basically what he says i think this is that episode mm -hmm. he says that right yeah and it's proven right when it fi turns out that the reason that he was even doing the fireworks in general is that he was obviously doing it so she could see it and yeah in gen uh, there's also a really nice moment where like no other character really knows the, the, what that means except for his wife and maybe Gintoki. Everyone else kind of goes like oh, it's it's weird that there's fireworks but the people, what the actual characters who know kind of like, they just kind of do a mowing like, oh man the old man did it. He still does kind of remember, which is a very nice feeling it's a, it was a, it's a very like kind of almost melancholy type of feel where it's like, this character is in theory going to eventually forget his wife and this old lady is going to die of her sickness, but there is still like Oh no, there's still a nice warm feeling about seeing someone even at that end of the rope still kind of remember what is important to them and stuff like that. So, I really liked it. I thought it was very nice. Yeah, it was think? very it was very sweet. It was uh this is the kind of shit that I'm that I'm I like Gintama for. Even when it's in little bite-sized bits like this, just like the little the little moment where they're all at the noodle stand and Gintoki's the only one who knows specifically what the firework was. I was like, that shit hits. Shit fucking yeah, hits. It does. It really does. It was very well done. How well this series could do. The same in the same episode that features a character chucking penises at someone. They also have this extremely <laughs> lovely moment, which I think is very uh, awesome. <laughs> in, in, a, in a, so so many words. So. Oh, well, this is also where I think the new ending comes in as well, right? We have our fourth ED. Candy yes, line, which is the start yes. of this one. So now we're at two OPs, four EDs. They're, we're going through the EDs like crazy, but the OPs. Yes, we are the burning same. the endings uh, like nobody's business. 
and I actually kind of like the the ED as well because it shows the Gimpachi uh, Sensei, but they actually show I guess what the other look like how how the other parts of the school look like. So like other people as teachers, others uh, that like doing festivals and stuff like that, which I thought was kind of nice because we only ever see that world in the essence of. <laughs> There's a question that we choose to acknowledge but not answer. <laughs> so here we. <laughs> It is the only time yeah. we ever get to see it. There's there's one of those that's an ending bit on these that's yeah. extremely funny, and it's all about uh, Yakuza versus Alien, <laughs> which is one of my favorite bits that they've ever done. <laughs> Yakuza versus Alien was pretty good. We'll talk about that a little bit deep down, but yeah, I, that's why I brought it up. I like seeing that uh, environment there. I think it's gotten better since the first time it showed up, but I think it's because there's now more characters to kind of mess around with and do stuff with. But anyway, that's episode uh 39 perfectly good episode to start us off no that was episode 38 my bad now we're going into episode 39 which is called ramen shop with many items on the menu are generally not popular and its actual translation on country roll is ramen shops with long menus never do well yes so this is a katsura centric episode that i really like um it might be my favorite one of all the ones that we watched today Uh, so Katsura is like on a bicycle with a hat on, and he gets <laughs> stopped by the Shinsengumi. Yeah, the uh, the master of disguise, Katsura. <laughs> How the um, Shinsengumi have never discovered Katsura is fucking amazing because he constantly says his name and he has the yeah his name just out loud to people. Yeah, and um, he has the most based form disguises. The in funniest the world. part of this episode, we'll we'll get to it when I get there in the um the the like recap mm -hmm. but there's a joke about that I'll, I'll just explain it later when i talk yeah, about it we'll get, we'll get um that. yeah um <laughs> so he's like on a bike and he's got a hat on and he's like excuse me uh officers and it's okita and someone else uh just like a different shinsengumi guy mm -hmm. and they're like yeah we got to check you out because there's a pervert running around um the one from stealing the, underpants the most... again it, it's the same one from yep. the panty <laughs> episode he broke out of prison He's back somewhere. Beware. Uh, and then he is like biking away. Um, and then his hat falls off, and the Shinsengumi guy's like, "That hair, it's Katsura," <laughs> even though his hair was fully visible under the hat. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> so. Uh, Okita shoots a rocket launcher at him, uh, and it destroys the bike that he stole, but it actually does hurt him a little bit. His leg is bleeding. So he's trying to run away, and as he's doing it, he accidentally pulls a bra off of, like, a clothesline. And, uh, the owner is, like, right there, and he, he puts on one of the funniest fucking voices, and he says, uh, oh, I'm Santa Claus? <laughs> and then she knocks his ass out. Um, and he keeps making up a bunch of different excuses as to like why um, he's there and uh, <laughs> uh, eventually he, what does he say he's he's um, he's a wandering ramen person like ramen, ramen fan hunter. trying to find the, the way of ra the ramen hunter that's what it was Yes, he's trying to find the true way of ramen um, and then three dudes enter the shop and try to extort her for money um, and Katsura gets rid of them by dressing up as a waiter and drugging the fried rice. So they, uh, they leave. Uh, so they do, they do run out and then they end up trying to get revenge on the girl by selling her off and stealing the store and Katsura figures it out and he runs them down with her delivery bicycle. Um... <laughs> And then the Shinsengumi, like, he reveals himself himself to the Shinsengumi to do it, because he's got a saver. Um, and so they chase after him, so he has to leave after he saves her. But they have this little moment, because her husband was killed by the revolutionaries. And then he obviously is, like, the revolutionary guy. Yeah. And so uh, they, they have, like, this little moment um, where they... It's kind of like, like an acknowledgement. Yeah, like they kind of like acknowledge one another and they're like, you know, thank you. Life happens and I already knew who you were, 
but you were hurt and I couldn't just like let something bad happen to you. Um, and then Gintoki goes there and it turns out that he like is a regular there. And he looks at their menu, and then he finds out that she added soba to the menu because earlier in the episode, Katsura said that he liked it more than ramen. Yeah, and that is the episode. And absolutely one of the funniest bits of the whole fucking episode. And it's not even really a bit, because, well, it might be, but it's played very seriously at the end. Is there the three dudes who try to sell off the girl? Um, Katsura attacks them at the end. And they're like, oh my god, it's Katsura. What are we going to do? Except earlier in the episode, they're like, what are you, a waiter? And he goes, no, I'm not a waiter. I'm Katsura. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yeah, you're right. (laughs) He does. He does. He totally (laughs) does. You're right. Katsura is the worst kept He goes, I'm not a waiter. I'm Katsura. (laughs) And they go, whatever, and then they go, oh shit, Katsura, it's actually, it's not Katsura, it's Katsura. You're right, I didn't even pick that up, that's funny. Yeah, so they're, they're, he's running like at them, and they're like, oh my god, it's Katsura, it's Katsura, what are we going to do? And then, but earlier in the episode, he told them <laughs> He did. Oh man. I really like... This episode, already, I already felt this before this episode, but this one really cemented it. I really do like Katsura. <laughs> I think he's awesome. <laughs> so I love Katsura. He, yeah, he's great. He's great. Here's something that I didn't, I, I picked up on while I was seeing it. I'm going to see if you noticed it. Did you notice that a lot of this episode felt like Fist of the North Star? I don't know that much about Fist of the North Star, so I couldn't tell you. Mm. Well, there, there's parts specifically when they do like close-ups of Katsura's face. You know the you know the Kenshin like super serious face where he's just like mm, staring off in the like staring. Mm-hmm. Um, while I was watching, I was like, "Damn, he looks all he that the way he's looking and the way that they're kind of going back and forth remind me a lot of Fist of the North Star." And funny enough, when I looked at the trivia for this episode on the, the there there was trivia for the on this wiki about this episode. The name of her ramen store is called the Hokuta Shinkin, Heart of the Dipper House. It's a reference to Hokita Shinkin, the Divine Fist of the North Star. That's funny. So I was like, <laughs> huh. But yeah, for some reason, a lot of this episode reminded me of Fist of the North Star, and I don't know if it was on purpose or if it was kind of like a slight reference. But I was like, huh. For some reason, in this episode, he feels a lot like a lot like that, like the uh, like him for 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 some reason. I wanted to see if you picked it up, but. I, I'm similar to you. I actually don't know that much about Fist of the North Star other than it's hyper violent and it's probably something we have to watch at some point <laughs> as well. We'll put it on yeah, the list definitely. <laughs> also that um, I think it's heavily censored as well. <laughs> the, the actual version we got. And also the manga I think is on like golden tablets I think somewhere. <laughs> I think it's the only manga that's ever been printed on golden tablets. Yes. Well, they're on like it's on like stone too. Didn't they like carve it into stone? I think that might be what it is. They car- carved it into stone. Something crazy like that. Something that's like, okay, yeah, sure. Very few manga could probably do this, but Fist of the North Star, sure, let's do it. Um, some other things about this episode, which is uh, some byproducts here, which really got me every single time it happened because it's the slow realization of. So. Elizabeth without Katsura, in the beginning, Elizabeth is looking yeah, for Katsura. Yeah, I completely forgot the Elizabeth hobo arc. Yeah, the whole, the Elizabeth, this is maybe the most sympathetic <laughs> I've ever been to Elizabeth, because Elizabeth goes fucking through it throughout the entire No, the of funniest it. part to me has to be, it's complete, we've never seen Elizabeth do this, and she doesn't do it again, but she's got a sign and she's wearing a Katsura wig and she's like, has anyone seen someone that looks like this man? Yeah. And a person walks by and goes, no one looks like this, and pulls the wig off her head, and she just, like, laser eyes him in the face. There, there's, like, a pause. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 and he even goes, like, and then she blasts him in the face. 
<laughs> Which I thought was really fucking funny. All the, Liz, the, the like the very quick Liz gags I thought was funny. There's like a part where after, <laughs> so after her wig thing, she still they cut back to her. She's back in there, except for now she has a sign that says "Looking to be adopted." Please adopt me. <laughs> and she's wearing the Katsura wig, which is I think the part of I can't find Katsura. Fuck it. Will someone please adopt me? Next, Katsura. <laughs> the, the one at the end where she says, "Look at my hair. I'm poor." <laughs> Get my hair up for that's the end of the homeless please look at my hair up for which by the way elizabeth does not have natural hair <laughs> that's a wig. yeah it's just a wig <laughs> i mean elizabeth found a wig to look crazy homeless <laughs> but there's a part where he, uh liz has to she needs to find work and she puts up a sign that says please hire me and <laughs> And the person says, I don't think so. And then they go back to her and she's like wearing a wig, lipstick, and blush. And then the next slide says, give me a chance. And it reveals that it's a love. Yeah, it says, give me a chance. Give me a chance. And he goes like, I think that's the reason why I don't want to hire you. Is that I don't want to give it a chance. And then go back to the homie. Elizabeth's hanging with the homeless. It has like crazy long black hair. It has like the hair of Madara, but homeless. <laughs> and then poor this poor fucking Elizabeth. Because I thought after this, like, oh, this is the part where they meet up with Kotsar again. No. And then the next time you see it, she's outside the ramen shop looking through the dirt, looking for food. And that's the end of the hobo Elizabeth arc as far as this episode goes. It's so oh, fucking funny. It was really funny. I was like, Look Damn. at my hair, I'm poor. <laughs> Look at my hair, I'm poor. But I also... Th- 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 all of it was funny. The eye beam <laughs> that, th- that they fucking does out of nowhere. The looking for adoption. The, the funniest part is that her eyes start blinking. And it's like... And then she blasts the dude right in the face. And it's guts. Yeah, that might actually be the, <laughs> the cover for this episode. Because it just really does come out of fucking nowhere. Uh, besides that... I really like the voice just like you when he says I'm Santa Claus after touching her bra. I thought it was also a very nice uh, setup of them mentioning the dude, the panty thief from the previous episode to kind of lead up to why he eventually kind of runs into this lady and why she was so aggro. Well, obviously anyone would be aggro if you caught him like that. Um, I like the red text in the beginning where it says wanted Katura Katsura. Today he is not the Fruit Punch Samurai because it reminded me of his online handle, which is the Fruit Punch Samurai. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, I'm I li- not the fruit punch samurai. I'm Katsura. <laughs> I'm Katsura. I like it when he says, "Like, how did you turn up here?" And he's like, "I took a wrong turn. A wrong turn up here." He's like, "In life, <laughs> I just..." <laughs> when he's trying to explain to himself why he's on her roof, accidentally touching her bra, he's like, "I took a wrong turn in life." I actually the, do have the, the fucking voice he puts on when he says he's Santa kills me. I, yeah, I can't even recreate. It's similar to when I, I, I can't did- even begin to recreate it, but it's not even close to his regular voice, and it's no. so fucking. Funny. It's similar to when Gin- uh, Gintoki called the ninja guy Peter Pan last episode. <laughs> Very similar energy. <Yeah. laughs> um, I like the fried rice bit because he just literally would not give up on it. He just keeps going. He's like, "Why do you?" Because he goes like, uh, "We're gonna have as an appetizer fried rice." He's like, "Well, that's a huge ass appetizer." He's like, "Sir, are you ready for your more for the rest of it? For dessert, we have fried rice. <laughs> for everything, we have fried rice." Um. Uh, let me see what we got here. Uh, I like it when uh, there's a brief moment where Okita and Hinchikata are talking to each other. And Hijikata says, like, you're really actually gung-ho. I've never seen you like this, which is true, because in a later episode, we see how Okita usually acts, which is not acting at all. <laughs> he th- doesn't do anything, but he's actually highly motivated for this. And he, he tells him, like, hey, you should watch out for yourself, Hijikata. And then when he leaves, the reason he said that is that he left paper bombs. <laughs> he left the little cursed dolls bombs for Hijikata right there, and he blows it up on him. Uh, in terms of those are in terms of the jokes... Uh, in terms of the actual characterization, I really like the Katsura. The real reason that he wants to leave is that he's starting to actually doubt what he's doing. Because this is the first time where... Because at this point, Katsura as a character has like the most crazy resolve of anyone outside of maybe Gintoki. Where he very much is like, I'm here for the revolution. What I'm doing is just, we need to free Japan. And this is actually someone who kind of suffered from the mindset of what he's doing. is like, if they can't even defend the people then what the hell, how do you expect them to free Japan if the people themselves are end up uh, 
you know, destroyed by their actions. And he's the real reason it feels like he wants to leave is not... Maybe there's some parts of it where it's maybe he feels a little bit like romance, but I feel like there's another part of him that wants to leave because he feels like being here makes him question what he does and he feels uncomfortable with that because he this is basically all he has for lack of a better term is that this is his mission this is what he has to do here's a character who basically (laughs) suffered due to the kind of people who were i guess similar in his ideas but not exactly him but it's still something that he's never had to deal with and at the end of it he feels like he kind of uh, the person that he talked to at least understands that he's not like the people who hurt her husband or killed her husband. So that's why they can kind of leave off in good terms and everyone's happy, hunky-dory, as far as this episode goes. And then I did like that she added Soba as well. Because he does, at the Uh beginning, when he's injured and he's giving it, Robbie's like, I prefer Soba. He's like, are you giving me, like, (laughs) tips as to help you? Yeah, yeah, he's like, she gives him a bowl of ramen, and then he's like, Soba's my favorite food. And she's like, are you telling me that you want Soba instead? Yeah. Another good bit is that when he's looking outside while e- he's also still eating the ramen, <laughs> even while he's looking outside, which reminded me of that episode of the when he went to go work at the uh, the the cross dressing bar, where he also got in a heated argument over I think was it ramen or was it soba? It's the one thing I can't remember if it was ramen or soba. Now that I mention it, but it was very similar. It was about food, and he immediately started going after them <laughs> just because they slightly cut in line. So I thought it was a good reference back to him just super caring about food for some reason. Um, I also like that he keeps using the excuse that it's raining as to why he can never leave. <laughs> yeah, so. I like when uh, she's like, "Hey, can you do a delivery for me?" And then he grabs his stomach like he has a stomach ache, and then he says, "Oh, it's raining so much." <laughs> <laughs> instead of saying ah oh, my stomach hurts yeah <laughs> it's it's raining it's oh my god it's raining so bad he's like what the, whatever if you don't want to go it's fine but yeah i really like this i think it delivers on all parts like i said as we mentioned here the the, the bits with katsura are great okita actually even has a little bit of a moment where you get to see him if he actually took shit serious which is maybe the closest they've ever come to actually capturing uh katsura uh, they also show that when, because he assumes that the dudes who are kidnapping the, trying to sell off the girl, he assumed the concert was inside there, which is why they ran. He had no idea that they were keeping a woman inside there. So when they shoot uh, open fire on him and stuff like that, when they go through the smoke, he kind of sees that the reason he would jumped in there was that there was someone there he was trying to save, which is, I think the reason that he's actually able to escape is that he gives him like a, it gives him a brief pause to go like, ah, oh, damn it. Like, cause they were so focused on him, they didn't even bother to think about what, they didn't even bother to think that it could be something like this happening. So I think that's kind of also another reason he was kind of let go for that reason. He was able to escape so easily in that sense, because they really did have him pinned down for the majority of the episode as well. Uh, uh-huh. So I really like Also, I like one. how he defeats the two people who kidnapped her by just hitting them in the face with fried <laughs> with rice. fried rice. A really awesome shot, too. <laughs> Full force on the bike, slams their face in with fried rice. Yeah, and then the bike skids down the street, and he does, like, a superhero landing in the middle of the street. Yeah, real good. So I think the episode delivers on all fronts. It's a fantastic Katsura episode. It's got some good level T of thinking stuff emotional wise. And it also has some great funny bits. And this is officially the best stuff I've ever seen with Elizabeth. Because holy shit, I was dying by the end of it. And I thought it was great stuff. They've really gone in much better since the initial uh, uh, debut of it. One moment. Uh, one moment. I'll be right back. Okay. And we're back after that. <clears throat> and so, yeah, just to sum up, because I don't remember where I left off, really liked this episode. I thought on everything that they were going for kind of hit, and I thought it was a fantastic showcase for Katsura, and it's also an episode that did not focus on any of the main three, and they did a fantastic job with only the the strength of the characters that they had. Which so that was great. And even the new character they introduced, I thought also thought was uh, great, too. <laughs> So it worked out for me in every single aspect. I think, for, like, for you, this definitely is my favorite of the bunch. And the other two are pretty strong in my eyes. But this one is a different kind of breed compared to the other ones. How do you feel, Zen? It was very good. I really liked it. Um, yeah, it's... I don't know if it's the first episode without the main cast in it. I'm assuming it is. 
Um, I think the Shinshin Gumi one might have been. Uh, I actually no. In terms of a full, because the other one. In terms of them literally not being relevant, other than that little tiny scene where Gintoki has like two lines. Yeah, I think you're right. <clears throat> Which I feel like probably only existed because I don't know if you remember this, but wasn't there like a rule back in the day where the protagonist had to show up? Cool. Like in all Shonen Jump things in general. Yeah, where it was like a Shonen thing, where they were like you couldn't you couldn't do stuff where the protagonist didn't at least like pop his head in. Which is huh. why you get little scenes like this where the protagonist will just randomly be like, "I'm here too." Huh. I never heard of that, but that that would that would make a lot of sense, especially for you know, <laughs> usually in most Shonen um, <clears throat> series, the protag is the strongest character. It's very, very rare that it's actually one of the side characters who was more loved or more cared about in that sense, if that makes sense. So I, I even though I haven't heard of it, it would make a lot of sense and it would explain him kind of showing up at the end. But yeah, I mean, it was a fantastic episode. I loved their little moment um, after he rescues her. It's also funny because she's like, I already knew. And it's like, of course... She already knew because you said your name <laughs> earlier in the episode. Um, uh, it, it was it was high quality. I'm all about it. Yes, fantastic job here. So, move on to the next one with the final one, which is the funny enough the start of the next arc that we got here, which is called the Umibo, um, Umibozo arc. We have episode forty. Which the raw translation we have here is one needs to be systematic in having children, or as Crunchyroll called it, give a thought to planned pregnancy. (laughs) Which is a very strong title. (laughs) Amazing (laughs) title. Fantastic. Um, Go ahead. So the famous alien hunter named Umibozu shows up on Earth chasing after. some kind of big ass alien. Um, yeah, we don't know much about it in this episode. You don't know much about it, yeah. Um, and Kagura gets a weird phone call that's pretending to be Gintoki, and uh, she runs off to help him. But then it turns out that she runs into like this alien that's attacking everyone. Um, they. <laughs> They do this, the Shinsengumi do this thing where they surround the, um, the bank, the bank. It's a bank. That's what it is. Yeah. And they're like, alien, think about your mother. (laughs) She didn't raise you to be an alien like this. And then the mother is Kondo in an alien suit. (laughs) Um, uh, and then Gintoki and Shinpachi think Kagura is the one robbing the bank, so they go to the bank, and then it turns out she's being attacked by this monster trying to eat her. Um, they just leave her, and she grabs <laughs> onto them as they're trying to just leave her there. Um, and then they get rescued at the last minute by Umibozu, and uh, it turns out that Umibozu is Kagura's father, um, and he wants her to come back with him, and she says, no because she loves being in Edo and they start fighting and Umibozu wins in the end and she says she's still not going to uh, going to leave but then Gintoki tells her that he should go home with her father because Edo isn't big enough for her uh, and she begs him not to leave her behind but he turns around and walks away and that's that's <clears throat> not how the episode ends but that's how the basics premise of this story ends for now the actual episode ends with a the sensei bit <laughs> where they talk about the differences between well they they bring up the fact that an alien and a yamato there are differences and then they never tell you what they are <laughs> they get too busy screwing around yeah and they're like the differences between an alien and a yamato and then they don't ever talk about it <laughs> they never mm-hmm. say it and then kondo says i think <laughs> he's still in the alien mom costume says i think i might be a alien yeah i think i am an alien (laughs) he's like i think you should discuss this with your parents yeah go home and have a conversation with your mother (laughs) your mother 
<laughs> and then there's another bit where they're talking about again this movie which is which bookends the beginning and is in the middle of the episode which is aliens versus yakuza uh this movie the which featuring uh what is it called joe bro that's yes. what the, featuring joe bro which his name is is joe otunaji which literally means adult circumstances <laughs> And it's a series in which they are making fun of aliens versus predators. Because apparently, I did not know this, Yakuza is a pun on the other name for predators, Yataja. So it's similar enough where they were like, okay, yeah, Yakuza versus, aliens versus Yakuza, sure, let's go. Um, There's not much we know about the movie other than apparently I think Jobro might get killed at the end because uh, Hijikata is extremely broken up (laughs) about what happens in this movie. Yes, when they're in the... Is this the one where they're in the car and he's like, you alien scum? Yeah, when he runs over Kondo, he's like, another dead alien. Yeah, he runs over Kondo in the car. Alien scum. <laughs> it's so funny because he's like, yeah, it's like your mother, you should never act. They immediately run him over. Um. Uh, so- yeah, it's a good good episode uh yeah. i actually watched the rest of this little arc because i thought it was going to be a two-parter then it was actually a three-parter uh so we have two more parts of this little arc to talk about but this was uh this was really good i like this one okay i will say for mine i really liked it it was a good start of what is going to be in essence another arc um they have some good i'm a, i don't know if you know this um if you've seen enough of videos from me, you might pick up on it. I'm a big fan of the tagline for AVP, Aliens vs. Predators, which is, whoever wins, we lose. <laughs> and they make fun of that title in this episode where he says, whoever whoever side standing, we both lose. And he goes like, how does that make sense? What's Yo- <laughs> The aliens are third, but also Yoshi- <laughs> Yo- <laughs> Joe Bros are a threat to us as well. <laughs> Which totally doesn't make sense in the context of if the aliens are fighting a singular Yakuza man. Uh, they also make some good references. I like all the little clips that's like uh, a man that speaks from his back and it's like his Yakuza tattoo. It's, Yakuza <laughs> it's just like tattoo. alien versus Yakuza. Aliens versus Yakuza. It's the most silly. It also feels like also for the world itself, it feels like it's the ultimate like uh, propaganda film because everyone who watches is just like, yeah, fuck aliens. <laughs> they're so anti-aliens. Yeah, there's literal cutaways. They're like, we hate aliens. <laughs> <laughs> we hate them so much. Which, Which I is- assume is why they have that class bit where they're like, oh, uh, Amantos totally aren't aliens, you guys. <laughs> there's a difference. Um, okay, and then never bringing up <laughs> for it at all. Uh, I like the one of the the beginning gag of uh, Cargo getting tricked by the phone scam, which the it's the it's me gag, where the person just says it's me to make you think that it's whoever is in trouble, and the person who's like it's me, and she goes like yeah, and Kintogi is like yes, it's me, I'm in trouble, I've run over a pregnant woman. Then she says you should finish the job. <laughs> and come over it's like that's a horror that's a terrible thing to say no i need money but then the the the, the, i need you to deposit money gets misinterpreted as i need you to throw rice and throw rice yeah and even the bank teller is like you have to be saying deposit and she's like no shut up get out of my way yeah i'm like wait idiot i'm throwing rice and she's just like chucking rice in this bank She's like spinning in circle going, I need to save Gintoki from the priest, which is also a mistranslation of what she means. Also, uh, Gintoki is literally just in the bathroom. Yeah. And, the and whole when, time, she, he just walks right out. Yep. And when they talk and about... And he's like, what? Yeah, what? And then when they hear the news about this scam, which is how we know about it, he's like, no one would fall for it except for the idiotic Amazonian woman in here. And then they realize that she's gone and they go, hmm. And they immediately leave. <laughs> <laughs> they just yeah, like, run like out, oh no leave behind Sadaharu. Um, I like the gag when they're looking for because Umi Bozo shows up and then I also like the way he shows up because he shows up in a totally badass way. And then when they reveal his character design, he looks the most like a goober ever. <laughs> With his glasses on, he looks like the most middle aged man possible. Um But when Yeah, he when shows... he pulls the helmet off. Yeah, yeah. and he's got the the and they glasses. all call him bald, and he's like, I'm only bald on the top. Yeah, <laughs> I'm only bald on the top, <laughs> i still got hair. Uh, 
but the, there's a gag where they talk about the alien that he's looking for because he's the ultimate alien hunter and they talk about how the person who it could possess anything um it, you'll have to look for um so, uh, something with bags over, over their eyes we're looking for a panda and so everyone in the shishingumi takes it as we're looking for a real ass panda and they show the shishingumi going to the zoo looking for pandas and then kondo realizes that the, he's gonna get misinterpreted he's like oh actually we're not looking for a real panda we're looking for kind of it kind of looks like a panda you know because of the eye thing and he's like trying to explain himself and while everyone else is out crazy looking for stuff they show okita who's just like uh at, in the base watching tv and then he sees it on the TV that there's a bank robbery and he goes like, oh, it's a panda because <laughs> they show the the alien and he sees the uh, the black under the eyes. So they're able to figure it out there. I really like it when they're trying to t- convince this alien who's not very smart that its mother is going to be disappointed in it, <laughs> which is the ultimate tactic of. Uh, I also like the, the joke where um, they're riled up from seeing the movie. And Kondo's like, I don't know what's going on right now. And he's like talking to them over the radio. Oh, yeah. He's like, and they're like to... super gung-ho. We have to do it for Joe, bro. And he's like, who's Joe? <laughs> who's Joe? Who's... Is he harmed? Is he okay? Yeah, is, I think a civilian named Joe is down. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Um, That bit's great. I really like it when... uh. When Umbozo, the reveal of he's the father is because he's using the same weapon that Kagura has been using. Also, when he uses it, it's like ten times more powerful than what Kagura has been doing, basically. Because he com- yeah, he com- like throws it and destroys this alien completely. Yeah, and one hit is like, oh my god. And then when they actually do fight each other, I think it's the first time in which Kagura actually kind of gets uh, bested. Because up until this point, Kagura has been able to outstrength almost anything. Obviously, that alien is a little bit different because we i think it might have snuck up on her or something but she wasn't able to beat that alien but he's able to beat it pretty easily not much effort and then he's able to outpower her in multiple ways he's able to outfight her he's basically the he's basically what the uh yato clan why they're so strong is that he's showing off the crazy strength that they possess i like it when they're fighting uh they have this squabble where he's like you can't live with a man like that's his big complaint is like you can't you're a, you're a single woman. You can't just be living with a man, unless you get unless the only way that happens is unless there's like a pregnancy and there's a forced pregnancy. He's like like you with mom. He's like oh my god. It's like did she tell you? Did that bitch tell you about that? <laughs> about how he had to he had to he had to it was a forced uh, marriage between them because he got uh, her pregnant early. Um, and then there was a lot of. And then the the bit at the end where Gintogi's... Oh, no, there's another bit where, before that, he actually says there's no reason for this domestic violence, and he says domestic violence like she did in that episode with the with the robot, where they fully out say, domestic violence. Yeah, <laughs> he says this is not a time for domestic violence. Domestic violence, <laughs> which I always appreciate. I, in my notes, I hear I say, the return of domestic violence. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I like it when uh, Gintoki's kind of doing the mind I think what he's seeing is what I'm interpreting here, you actually seen the episode so don't tell me if I'm right or wrong on this one but I think the reason that he kind of tells her to go is that he sees how strong she is and how strong she could be and I think also her father at the beginning says like a lot of people try to use our clan for nefarious purposes and I don't want my daughter to be used in the same way uh and they have (laughs) she got lucky because she's literally with someone who does not care about any of that kind of stuff (laughs) they only seem to keep her around because why not (laughs) because they're friends yeah they're literally just like she's just our bud (laughs) yeah she's just our bud so let's whatever she works for us let's go um which is the best situation she could be in but still as a as a dad and being how strong it is so gintoki is able to see how strong that they can be with all the destruction that they kind of laid waste and how much Umi Bozo himself doesn't really seem to care about the casualties. Like, he's able to toss his daughter, and he was... It didn't seem like he was too brought up about the fact that it would have potentially hurt a child and mother. So maybe he's kind of putting it in his head of, like, if she's gonna get this strong, I don't actually think that the world is legitimately gonna be able to handle someone of this much strength, though I need to kind of let her go somewhere else. Because otherwise she's going to completely destroy this place. And... 
it's also something that her dad says where her dad says that our clan is not really one that is meant to be kind of peaceful. We're hunters. We kind of have it in us that we need to hunt. And if you don't do what we're doing, then you become something that's like... It, it, you, be, you start to become something that doesn't take into factor their, your own strength and you start to become, you, you start harming things that you don't intend to because you just aren't used to being a predator anymore. Or you're not, you're fighting back what you are, so you're supposed to be, which is being fighting. And Kagura herself says like, I don't want to be like that. I don't want to be like you. I kind of want to, if I, I think that if I stay here, I can actually actively fight what our clan is known for and I don't want to be like that. And that's the kind of distinction that they seem to have. And in general, she does not want to go back with him. So at the end of the episode, when uh, Gintoki says, I think you should go, it's actually kind of sad because she is really heartbroken about it. Even Kondo himself says when he looked in the eyes of Umi Bozo, it was someone who does not spend time at home. It's someone who kind of like there's like two types of, I think, fathers, he says. It's the ones that can that are family men. And then there's the ones who are basically who go out and get st- get stuff done and then never actually see their family and that's what he sees in his eyes so that means that Kagura must have had an extremely sad upbringing because of it so it's interesting to see that kind of play out and just seeing how devastated she is because it is extremely devastating because we saw when uh Gintoki lost his memory how much she was the one that was like no we need to wait for him he's gonna remember us we can bring it back so to see that kind of to have that kind of reaction to have that kind of bond and then have it be like this person is telling me that I should go, it would be extremely devastating. So I'm kind of interested to see where the episode goes from here, but it's a good introduction for the beginning of this arc. And I'm looking forward to seeing the other episodes sometime before we talk about it next week. But that's how I thought about the episode. What do you feel about it, Zen? Uh, I really liked it again. Um, I like the Umi Bozu joke where he's like a middle manager, like, paper pusher looking kind of guy uh but he's like the greatest warrior in the galaxy <laughs> um i thought the ending bit was really sad when gintoki tells her to leave even if he's doing it for what he thinks is her own good um i thought that was very very emotional and sad in a way that the interactions between the two of them generally are not um But it's kind of hard for because I watched the next two. It's hard for me to talk any more about the things I really liked about mm-hmm. this one without getting into the next two. So I think I'll probably leave it there. It was a very good episode. It sets up a lot of good stuff. Okay, fair enough. And we will talk about those episodes next week. So look forward to that. But for now, for well, that's it. The it for these three episodes. Another good batch of three episodes as we get closer to the end of season one, which is episode forty nine. Funny enough, and then I think episode fifty is a recap sort of thing. So very close to the end of season one. Then I I actually looked at the very list close. Like, Damn, I can't believe we're actually super close to the end of season one. And like we said beforehand, we are going to be continuing uh, Yintama because now we also have GX to talk about on the side. Even though we weren't able to talk about GX because of how busy we've been, we'll, we'll be getting back to that, no problem. Yeah, but we've yeah. been prioritizing Gintama, but GX is still yeah. there. Yes, exactly. But yeah, 39 was definitely the strongest of these three, but all very good. So yeah, that is the end of Shonen Archive. Once again, we thank you very much for joining us and seeing everything all the way. Uh, It is not easy for us to find time to record it, and so we appreciate everything of the people who watch it, the people who comment, the people who just silently watch and don't need to comment, don't feel the need to comment. We also appreciate you. The people who leave the likes because YouTube is a hellscape where you need to do that in order for things to thrive. Mm -hmm. In order to function. Yeah, all you guys do it uh, on a consistent basis, which I appreciate a whole bunch, and we thank you for it. As always, you can leave down below in the comments how you feel about any of the episodes we talked about, or in general, if you want to talk about how the wiki, the the fandom, if you really want to get into the fandom wiki, I would love to hear your thoughts on it. <laughs> I will gladly talk to you about the fandom wiki. <laughs> but in general, any of your thoughts about the episode again, Tama, we'd love to hear it. But yeah, that's the end of Shonen Archive. Thank you very much for joining us. We'll see you guys next week for episodes, hopefully, episodes uh, 41, 42, 43, 44, and 45, right? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, yes. I always 
for some reason the five thing but that's what we're going to be doing next week so join us next time as me and zen finally end an episode perfectly fine we finally i, I told you i was going to do it last week zen <laughs> i told you the ending would be good this week and i did it you did do it <laughs> unbelievable and now i've ruined it but it's okay that's part of the bit goodbye everyone <laughs> goodbye everybody time.